All right, we'll get started. In the prior lectures we had seen about rectangular waveguides and their modes and the field distribution and expression, etc. In this class, I'll just demonstrate to you how simply you can extend that analysis to a rectangular cavity resonator. Okay, so I'll begin with rectangular. cavity resonator. So, the idea is simply this, in the past we had seen about uh, properties of the waves travelling within a single medium. We also saw about properties of waves at an interface, alright. So, we also discussed about what happens between a dielectric and a metal interface. After that we talked about two dielectric metal interfaces in the form of a parallel plate waveguide. And then we proceeded even further to have four rectangular walls forming a rectangular waveguide and we saw the description of the fields in such a structure in the past. Just to brush up what we had seen earlier, the structure looked like a rectangle in cross section and it was assumed to be infinitely long. All right. And the assumption is you have the top, bottom and the four sides to be made up of metal and the region inside over here could be a dielectric. It could be vacuum or it could be any other dielectric, right. So, we had seen this particular case and to summarize what we had seen without going into too many details, we saw that there is a frequency <coughs> known as the cutoff frequency and those are the frequencies that will propagate, okay. And the description for the for cutoff frequency, we have already seen that uh, we can arrive at the cutoff frequency for different kinds of modes and we also discussed what the modes would look like, right how many sinusoids or how many half cycles of the sinusoids you will have in each direction etc. This discussion has been done for parallel plate and rectangular waveguide in the past. Now in this lecture what we are going to do is we are going to make some small modifications to this structure. Previously we had seen that the electromagnetic wave would be launched in this port like this and it would travel through the waveguide forming some standing wave patterns in the cross section and it would arrive on the other side of the waveguide, but we saw that the waveguide is infinitely long or is impedance matched, so you do not get any reflection back, okay. In this particular lecture, we are just going to change this detail, right. Let us go ahead and make the facets, right, also to be of metal, right. Let us also go ahead and remove this condition where it is semi infinite right, or where it is infinite right. and let us say that you have a facet on the back side which is also going to be made up of a metal. So, in other words you have a cuboidal box and all the walls of the box are made up of metal. So, there are 6 uh, phases, each one of them is being made up of a metal and you have a dielectric region inside. If there is a chance of uh, exciting all right, this structure with an electromagnetic wave from inside, all right, suppose we connect a source from the inside, what would be the field description inside this volume is what we are going to talk about. So, this lecture will have two parts, the first is the analytical part, then I will go over some of the pictures of the waveguides. Uh, that are used uh, you know conventionally in practice so that you get a feeling for what they look like. And then the last part we will have a simple demonstration uh, which you can relate to very well because I will be making use of a conventional appliance to show what the cavity modes would look like in practice. Okay. So here if there is a source and if we were to excite the structure with a source, what would be the description of the electromagnetic wave? Now, in order to proceed with this analysis, let me just recap what we had seen for a rectangular waveguide, all right, for the TM mode, okay. So, 
So the rectangular waveguide, I am not going to write all the uh, components, I am just going to write the electric field uh, Z component. So I have a rectangular waveguide and uh, TM mode was already done in class. And from the prior lecture, <coughs> I just had the description for EZ as a position of, I mean uh, depending upon the position X, Y and Z coordinates, all right, was looking like a constant C times sin m pi by a into x sin n pi by b into y and if we are talking about the forward and the forward wave only we had a description which said that it will form a plane wave right kind of a, it will form a propagating wave all right along the length of the waveguide or the longitudinal direction of the waveguide so this is what we had and uh, now I will mark a few quantities to make this a little bit clearer, right, okay. So in the earlier class what we had done was we had marked the cross section with A and B. So we will do the same thing over here. So this part could be A and the height in the cross section could be B right? <coughs> and we can now start with this description and add the two facets and bring in the uh, extra uh, analysis that is needed for analyzing this structure with six walls. Right? So what was this is the forward wave. Now because we have introduced a metal wall at a finite distance, we will have a reflection and there will be a backward wave. Right? Okay. Now there will be a backward wave and just for the sake of completeness I will write both the forward and backward wave once again. So the forward wave is going to look like the description that I already have. So I am just going to rewrite that here. So I am just going to say EZ but I am going to make a note that it is forward. Still depends on X, Y and Z positions. It is looking like a constant multiplied with sin M pi by A into x sin n pi by y sin, sin n pi by b into y e to the minus j beta z m and n are the mode numbers all right so uh, we also saw the details about what m and n could be all right for the mode to exist m or n should not be equal to 0 right so the fundamental tm mode will be 1 1 right this we had already seen so I am just extending this, if I had to write down the backward wave just by looking at this expression, I can mark new term, right. EZ backward will also depend on the position X, Y and Z and I can say that this could be some constant. With respect to the cross section, the standing wave patterns are going to look identical. So I do not have to change the first two uh, uh, expressions or the first two part which have the sinusoids because this is fixed for the forward and the backward wave. The only thing that is going to change is just like in transmission lines and just like in plane waves, we just denote the backward traveling wave with e to the j plus j beta z. Okay. So with respect to the cross section the patterns will be same but with respect to the direction of propagation we definitely have a change. The forward wave is going in the positive z direction, the backward wave is traveling in the negative z direction. Right? Now one of the things that we can talk about when we have a forward and backward wave is the total electric field. Okay, now that we have the expression for a forward traveling wave and the backward traveling wave in this structure. We can always look at the total electric field, all right. We can write down the 
the total electric field to be a superposition of the forward and the backward electric fields all right so we can write this as ez total is going to be equal to the superposition of the forward wave and the backward wave for which i have the analytical description so i have the uh, fields and i know how they will look like all right just by a glance from the waveguides expression i am just going ahead and uh, uh, writing down for forward and backward waves now one of the things that we can do is uh, once you know that you are going to be talking about uh, summation of these two in these structures since the longitudinal uh, direction is also finite we can talk about reflections that will be happening at these boundaries or at these extremities so one of the things that we can do is apply boundary conditions say at z equal to distance d right now in the diagram z equal to 0 corresponds to the place where uh, is one extremum all right z equal to d is the other extremum you can apply the boundary condition either here or here doesn't matter it will be identical all right so i'm just taking one place and we can say that at that place all right the boundary condition is going to be that ez forward is going to be ez backward because it's the normal component and that's completely reflected back so i can simply write this as ez forward is equal to ez backward right so if you were to take it at d all right you will substitute z equal to d in e to the minus j beta uh, thing and e to the plus j beta z if it makes it any simpler you can always take z equal to 0 because in that way you will get rid of this term at all fully so you'll have e to the minus 0 and then e to the plus j 0 so you can get rid of it and then you will notice that the constants c and d are actually identical all right so this is another way you can apply the boundary conditions anywhere z equal to 0 is very simple because you eliminate some two terms so ez forward becomes equal to ez backward and the implication is that the constant c has to be equal to constant t so we applied the boundary condition just to figure out the proportional relationship between c and d in the expressions for the electric fields this now means that the total electric field right is going to be a summation of these two quantities that's going to be c sin m pi by a into x <coughs> sin n pi by b into y and e to the minus j beta z is the forward part plus e to the plus j beta z is the backward part so you have some summation of two complex exponentials coming into the picture for the total electric field uh, expression so once again you can apply some trigonometric rules for uh, reducing the uh, exp complex exponentials on the right side so this means that i will end up having two times c sin m pi by a into x sin n pi by b into y and i'll have a cosine beta z right so on the right side now i have two times a constant that will determine the amplitude of this electric field all right uh, then i have sin m pi by a into x which will determine the uh, pattern or the standing wave pattern about the x direction and in our diagram it is the horizontal di direction of the cross section sin n pi by b into y it will determine the number of half uh, cycles that you will have in the vertical direction and cos beta z tells you what kind of pattern you will be having in the longitudinal direction now if you wanted to be more specific about uh, this cos beta z all right you can once again apply boundary condition previously we had applied it at z equal to 0 now in order to get a better description of what this beta z could be all right we can always do the same things that we had done 
for the rectangular waveguides to arrive at m pi by a into x n pi by b into y and which is simply using boundary conditions. So, I know that in the position z equal to d okay, at the position z equal to d according to this diagram I am having an interface once again between the dielectric and the metal wall. So, the wave that is travelling forward hits the wall gets reflected back and it has to be reflected back fully and since the forward and the reflected wave are having e a similar description alright. So, the waves will have to add up and the maximum will be present at the place where the interface is present. So, the maximum will be at the interface alright. So, here that gives us some idea the cosine will reach its maximum alright at z equal to d you will write this as beta d alright. The argument of the cosine will look like beta d and for the cosine to be maximum its value has to be equal to 1 and this means that uh, you will be having some l times uh, pi okay l times pi. So, here we are not worried about the sign so much okay. So, beta d is equal to l pi right which means that I can write down beta to be l pi divided by d right. So, beta looks like l pi by d right. okay beta looks like l pi by d. So, this means that I can take the prior expression and rewrite this as 2 c sin m pi by a into x sin n pi by b into y and cos l pi by d into z okay. I could have used O, but O usually gets confused with uh, 0. Again I could have used C for the denominator, but Z is what we are using for the velocity of light in this course. So, I had to choose some slightly different variables which gives me cos l pi by d into z. So, here the thing that we notice is that this is the total electric field that is present in the volume of this cavity. If I wanted to find out what the electric field would be at a location x comma y comma z inside this cavity, I would simply substitute the value of x comma y comma z in this formula alright. And if I have some knowledge of C, then I will be able to exactly figure out what the electric field would be at different place for the z component right. And once I know that I can calculate say different components based on the Maxwell's curl equations. Some of this we have already done in the past. So, you can refer, refer to the past lectures okay. So, this expression corresponds to what is known as a cavity and there is a reason why right. Now, in the case of rectangular waveguides that we had seen in the prior lectures. In the case of rectangular waveguides, <coughs> we wrote down a relationship while analyzing the modes, all right, and uh, we saw that. The cutoff frequency, we used omega suffix c alright, it looked like 1 by square root mu epsilon n pi by b square alright. So, this is the expression that we have from the prior lectures right. Now, as before we can extend the same analysis here. We can say in this particular case just look at the third dimension alright and wherever you had beta. So, if you look at the prior lectures wherever you had beta for the uh, waveguide So, we had an expression which says that uh, omega square mu epsilon is equal to beta square 
plus m pi by a the whole square plus n pi by b the whole square all right now instead of beta we just have to substitute l pi by d so the same old expression we can use just that we have to make a substitution for beta to be l pi by d in accordance to the boundary condition for the structures that we are talking about now right so here all we need to do is we have to rewrite that expression omega square mu epsilon where mu and epsilon are the permeability and permittivity of the material that is covering the volume all right I mean that is forming the volume covered by metal plates right so this is going to be equal to m pi by a the whole square plus n pi by b the whole square plus l pi by d the whole square this means that i could write down an expression for the frequency which is going to be 1 by square root mu epsilon once again mu and epsilon are the dielectric uh, parameters so it's the dielectric constant and the permeability of the material inside the volume right multiplied with m pi by a plus n pi by b whole square plus l pi by d the whole square the whole thing under a square root okay this is what the expression for the frequency looks like and just like before we can also make a few statements m n l are integers <coughs> m n l are integers so different values of m n and l can be substituted in this expression for a given cavity geometry which has the sides of a centimeters by b centimeters by c by d centimeters etc so if we are talking about a particular mode in a cavity which is having particular dimensions filled with a particular material with permittivity and permeability given then we can always find out the frequency that is supported by such a cavity but what is the key difference between this structure and the waveguides that we have analyzed in the past well there is one key difference and the key difference is different m n l give rise to discrete frequencies omega all right previously we had a inequality that is we had something like the input frequency has to be higher than the cutoff frequency right but in this particular case what we are noticing is that different m and l values will give rise to specific frequencies that are supported by these structures and uh, we have to make a note that the structure which is the cavity all right supports only these discrete frequencies it supports discrete frequencies okay which can form the standing wave patterns according to the boundary conditions in all the sides and these kinds of discrete frequencies all right are known as cavity resonance frequencies okay so for a given geometry depending upon the values of a b and d depending upon m and l you will have only one frequency which satisfies the boundary conditions and that will be your cavity resonance frequency for that particular mode okay so the key difference here is your cavity resonance frequencies will be discrete you don't have an inequality saying that frequencies above this cavity resonance frequencies <coughs> just like in the wave guides we used in wave guides we used tm say mn to describe a particular 
mode whose cutoff frequency can be calculated by using the field descriptions that we had before. And in this case, in the case of cavity, the modes can be described by Tm, M, N and L. You just need three subscripts to describe what standing wave patterns you are talking about. M will tell you the number of standing wave half cycles that you have along the horizontal direction. N will tell you the number of half cycles along the vertical direction. L will talk about the number of half cycles you will be having in the longitudinal direction. So this kind of concludes uh, uh, the analysis for cavities. So if you were to take the T structure, transverse electric structure, you will have very similar approach and the end result will be same because they are degenerate. You will have the same expression for the cutoff frequencies for these cavities. You could do this as an exercise by using appropriate boundary conditions. And with that, now you know how to analyze a single interface, two interfaces, four interfaces and all six interfaces. If you know how to do one and if you uh, have a fair understanding of the boundary conditions, you will be able to pick up from your last point and then elevate the analysis to higher levels. Okay. Now what we will do is we will have a look at a few uh, pictures and uh, uh, talk about a few practical aspects of the waveguides that are used in practice. All right. So I am having a picture over here. This is what a rectangular waveguide looks like. All right. These are for you know hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz frequency. I do not know the exact dimension. Looks like it is a few centimeters uh, wide and few centimeters tall etc. But this is what it looks like. Okay. So you can launch the electromagnetic power on one side. You should expect a particular mode to be excited depending upon the dimensions and depending upon the frequency you are using and on the other side you will be able to detect them. The pictures that are shown here are straight waveguides, all right, are straight waveguides. It is not necessary that you need to have only straight waveguides, all right. You could bend, right. Okay. In this particular case, it is a very nice uh, waveguide construction because you are launching here. First, you are bending it along the horizontal direction, all right. Now, you will notice that the bend is very slow. In the previous class when we tried to do a computer experiment, we saw that if you had an abrupt bend, there is a mode conversion that is happening, all right. In this case, they have bent it very slowly rather than being abruptly. So maybe there is no mode conversion. I do not know the details of this, but it looks like it is a slow bend that is happening, okay. So there is a horizontal bend, goes to the other side, another horizontal bend on the other, uh, other side. These are all 90 degree bends. And then to make the problem even uh, better, you know, to give complete understanding, the bend is going in the vertical direction. So you could have three dimensional control on the way your electromagnetic wave is going to travel from one point to another. It is not necessary to be having a planar configuration. You could have con control over entire volume, okay. So whichever position you want, you can direct. So this is how it is constructed. So this is in practice. So on top you are seeing the antenna, all right, there is a giant dish antenna over here and from the antenna, all right, there is a waveguide that is coming into the picture. It is being bent, being bent again and it is being sent to some units which are going to detect and do some processing. This is from a radar, okay. So this is what in reality it looks like. Now if you see these kinds of structures, you should immediately strike your mind that maybe it has this shape because it is a rectangular waveguide, right. So this is what it looks like. On top of that, if you look at the bottom, there are multiple constructions here, here, here. All of these are rectangular waveguides. You also have something happening here. That is also a rectangular waveguide. So this is what it looks like, okay, practice. Where is it used, all right. So if you have a look at this, this is a fighter plane, <coughs> all right. Now, the front of the fighter plane usually has an antenna array, all right. This antenna array is used for detection and ranging, all right. 
So what happens is you can turn on the antenna, you can turn on a source of electromagnetic wave, okay. Then what happens is it will direct electromagnetic wave from the front of the aircraft, alright. And it also has detectors, right. So these are arrays of detectors which are placed over here. So it will, it, we all remember time domain reflectometry from our transmission line and we also remember that time domain reflectometry can also be done with electromagnetic waves, it's time of flight based things. So it will send a wave, it's going to get some reflected wave back. Based on the amount of time, it will it'll judge at what distance an obstacle is there. It could also do more complicated things like the shape of the object, etc. Right? But here in the simplest sense, you can gauge at what distance a conductor of some sort is there. Now how uh, the waves are transferred to a system that will do the analysis, if you notice carefully there is a large, uh, large number of slots present here, each of them is connected to a waveguide and the rectangular waveguide carries this information to a central processing place where it is converted into some other form and an electronic analysis you know is, is done. In order to show you how it, how that part looks like, right, so you can have a look over here, right, this is, is how an array of antennas will be connected to array of detectors using some waveguide. So you have large number of 90 degree bands going on, alright, this means a, some kind of an array detector and the energy is going to some place where it is going to get converted into say electric signal and then you are going to make uh, an analysis. So this is what it would look like, okay. So obviously these are going to be heavy, right, and these are going to be, uh, you know, uh, large depending upon the frequencies of operation, they could also be tinier, but, but this is conventionally, you know, the range of sizes that people use in the megahertz and gigahertz regime, right. So here this is another uh, just a simple you know, demonstration to show you <coughs> that even this is, uh, I think this is taken from inside the, uh, you know, inside a section from the aircraft itself, right. So it is not only on the outside, it, uh, the information also goes along the body of the aircraft to different places. Maybe they need to do a variety of, uh, you know, calculations, they need to do a variety of, uh, you know, processing, etc. It's just showing that, you know, you can have them inside, you can have them outside, it's, it's fine, right. So in the lab, what would an experiment look like? We have all already seen a demo for vector network analyzer, okay. We have also talked about uh, transmission line cables, etc. So in the lab, you would have a vector network analyzer, you will have a transmitter or a TX port, you will connect this using some special cables, alright, to your rectangular waveguides, alright, and you will connect the receiver port back to this. You could also have more configuration, you could keep an antenna over here, alright, you can excite it with something and you can have a receiving antenna which will receive and you can process it to a signal and all that, but in a typical lab. When you are doing an experiment with waveguides, this is what it looks like. So it is clear that you are taking different sections, putting together nuts and bolts and actually joining them together, alright. It is a very, very simple construction. So you get them in pieces of finite, uh, you know, sizes and depending upon your application, you will put them together, tighten it and then you, you can start using it, right. This is what it looks like in a regular lab. Now uh, these are all for waveguides. Now in this class we saw about waveguides that are covered with a metal on one side and the other side which means it is a box of metal and the box of metal the example that we have is a microwave, okay. It has metal on the right side, metal on the left side, metal at the bottom, metal at the top, metal at the back and you also have a glass door in the front. But if you noticed all your microwave ovens, they will not give you plain glass doors, okay. They will be having some pattern and there is also a bulb inside of the microwave, there is a pattern and that pattern is made up of metal, okay. If you look, it will be like a millimeter sized dots where you have openings for the visible light to pass through, okay. So the front is also actually acting like a conductor, alright, but it has got holes for you to see the visible. Visible wavelength is like 400 to 700 nanometers, it is very small, alright. So it has place to pass through, but a microwave typically operates in gigahertz. The wavelengths are in centimeters. So it does not pass through these uh, thin, I mean these small regions, okay. So in practice you can say that this is a cavity, 
but since you want to see what's happening you have made some slight imperfections now how does uh, this work you have a source of power that is connected to your mains okay and then you have a device which is known as a magnetron i don't think we have uh, you know bandwidth in this course to cover what's a magnetron etc we have an advanced course called antennas circuits and waveguides all right so there i think you will spend some time discussing about what is a magnetron typically it's a solid state device which will convert your uh, electrical energy into gigahertz power okay once it is done the electromagnetic wave is carried through a waveguide all right and then it is used to excite your cavity and the cavity naturally produces standing waves all right now this is known as the cooking cavity and this is a standing wave and there are some questions that come to our mind all right sometimes we notice that when we put the plate of food inside the microwave some portions are very hot some portions are very cold right suppose you put this means that some portions are getting heated more some portions are not getting heated more this is something that one would observe so in order to avoid that what people do is they put what is known as a turn table at the bottom so you have food rotating so that not the same portion is getting heated all the time so you have rotation on top of that to make it even more efficient some heat is being created inside so the mechanism of cooking is because the water molecules present in your food will actually absorb this microwave so they will oscillate and then due to the friction you are having heating up okay so that's the mechanism and uh, you are having some heat being produced in this cavity and some models could provide a stirrer which is nothing but a fan all right a fan that will rotate so that the heat is actually you know circulated inside to get more even cooking of some kind right so this is a cavity so it has a source it has a wave guide and it has a cavity right and this is what happens so another picture would be like this which just shows a little bit more detail on how this cavity is functioning so i'm having a power supply magnetron i'm having a wave guide and i'm having a wave stirrer the wave guide takes the power from the magnetron and actually launches it into the cavity now the cavity is a you know though it is present it needs to have specific dimensions because we know that it has to produce standing waves which match the boundary conditions at all these interfaces which means that there is some standard for the size of the you know the box that you can have that also means that for a given box you can have only specific source with specific frequency all right that means to be present etc but you can see the wave can directly hit the food it can have one bounce and hit the food it could have for example two bounces and then hit the food it could have many bounces hit the food etc but it's not an ideal cavity in any case because once you place the food you have disturbed something inside the cavity all right so small shifts sh are supposed to happen all right so uh, so the you know the way of cooking for one type of food is different than another type of food so one big jug of milk is different from one small cup of milk everything should happen so it's not a very ideal scenario but it does work okay so now what we are going to do is we are going to do this with a microwave all right i think i have a microwave all right so what i'm going to do is first going to, I'm, i'm going to open it right and i'm going to take off a few things first of all uh, i'm going to remove this glass plate over here it's going to be the turn table secondly i have a motor that twists this around so i don't want this i'm going to get rid of it right and uh, i also know that all the portions are made up of reflecting surfaces and this particular part if you notice it has some perforated uh, metallic cover right so i know that it's going to be a cavity and i know that the field values near these on the surface is going to be zero corresponding to the boundary condition all right so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to position a cup okay and i'm going to keep this plate on top of this cup okay like this all right and then i'm going to put something inside of it and i'm going to cook and i'm going to see whether i'm getting standing waves all right so this is an experiment that is done in multiple ways in multiple youtube channels so i thought there should be some indian touch to it so we'll be cooking papad 
okay. <coughs> so, I will put this Right. So, I have loaded them in some form covering the entire plate all right and I am going to close it. I do not really care what mode I choose it says soup why not. Okay. So, now I have it at about 15 seconds I can see that things have started to puff all right but I am going to remove this now all right and this is what I have I could of course do it for longer but this is good enough for me to make the analysis. Now one of the thing that I notice is some portions have puffed up some portions have not puffed up all right. So, I am going to place it as such and I am going to use our idea of standing wave. I am going to take a ruler <coughs> and I am going to measure the distance between two of the puffed regions all right. So, I am going to go ahead make a measurement like this right. So, if I were to look here all right between the adjacent ones having about 6.3 centimeters. I will confirm this with this side 6.3 I will just say another place has gone in. So, I will just make a measurement there also that is about 6.3 6.4 centimeters all right. So, 6.4 centimeters let us uh, think about this I will take a my mobile phone and make a quick calculation. So, I have 6.4 centimeters all I want to do is I want to calculate the frequency. All right. So, it is 3 times 10 to the power 8 all right divided by uh, 6.3 right let us. But now I have to apply some other thought. I know that I am creating standing waves all right and I know that I am going to be measuring these would be two anti nodes all right at the nodes you are having nothing. So, this uh, distance between two anti nodes is actually 6.3 centimeters. I also know from my past simulations etcetera that the spacing between the anti nodes and the spacing between the nodes in the case of a standing wave is half the wavelength and not the full wavelength. So, I have to accommodate for that I am having between 6.3 and 6.4. So, I am going to take 6.35 and I am going to say that 6.35 multiplied by 2 all right. So, that is about 12.7 okay. So, I am going to make a calculation for 12.7 all right. So, I am having 3 divided by 12.7 to give me the estimate. So, I am getting 2.36 gigahertz to be the frequency of the signal that is excited inside. Incidentally, this microwave has a writing on the back that says it is 2450 megahertz that is 2.545 gigahertz. I think my estimate with this simple experiment is actually very close ok. So, now I think you should be able to use a microwave and simply estimate what is the frequency that you are exciting. Now, this could change a little bit with the kind of food you are cooking also right. We already know that there is some imperfections hap happening in the cavity, but it should be around this region. Now, you can also do this experiment you could take this put it in the bottom and you will notice that there is a different pattern in the way the you know the puppets are blooming all right means that in the volume all right as you go from bottom to top as you go from left to right everywhere there are there is a standing wave pattern and depending upon the way you position the food different things can get cooked at a different rate. That is why you have a turntable and that is why you have a stirrer also that is a simple demonstration of a cavity and how to estimate the frequency of operation from the cavity. I think we are done all right.